Hey, everyone. I'm just going to decide I would go live for, I don't know, hopefully only an hour, maybe less. I just wanted to talk about some of the things that happened last night. So um, let me give it a few seconds, see if anybody shows up. Uh, it's a Sunday, so maybe a lot of people are busy. Hopefully they're out and they're not here uh, watching YouTube. But if you are, hey, you know. So I just wanted to discuss random things similar to what uh, streets, uh, the people on street show last night was discussing. Uh, and then, of course, look at chat. The, the topics will move along. However, chat moves along. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to discuss uh, Forrest Friends home today. Um, this doesn't really have much to do with Forrest Friends home solution. Um, certainly. I'm going to be getting into stuff that is special knowledge, and you wouldn't be required to know all of this stuff to to um, solve the poem. So this doesn't really have anything to do with a solution, but for those of you that use the poem and you like to go into rabbit holes and you like to research things, you might find some of this interesting. So let me see, make sure the stream is working, of course. Um, let's see what's going on here. Okay, so I've got a connection, so the stream is uh, working. The chat chat window back up here. Um, and also, I came out with a short video today, and I don't know how many of you watched it. It's kind of just like a, a teaser similar to stuff that um, I'm going to talk about today. And one of the things I just wanted to say as a joke, and I put it in the comment uh, for that short video, but unfortunately, I don't, I don't think it, I mean, not, not the comment. Um, I put it in a comment because I don't think the description shows up for the shorts. I, I, I don't know that. Um, so I joked around um, about something called the brown note. Uh, for those of you don't, that don't know, there's a certain frequency range uh, between 5 and 9 hertz. And th this is just a myth, but they, they're talking about brown notes because um, frequencies have um, an impact on your body. Everything is basically controlled with, uh, you know, that's not controlled. Maybe that was the wrong word. Sound can definitely have an impact on your body. And some people had said that there are certain frequency ranges that can cause you to have a bowel movement. So. There's always jokes about that. I'm sure uh, Davio 22 could relate because he was in the music industry. Uh, but people used to joke around uh, about that. Hey, hey, uh, Five Leaf. And I'm sure Five Leaf knows all about the brown note. So, yeah, it's a very low frequency and you, you can't hear it. So, they, you know, they, they, the theory is that if you have a bunch of uh, subwoofers out there in the audience and uh, you play a uh, certain frequency between 5 and 9 hertz that it'll cause people to be, lose control of their bowels. Um, it, and um, it, it, it's basically a myth. Um, it's been tested, and it's not true. It could make you nauseous and stuff like that. Um, but what's interesting about it is obviously sound, you know, and music um, is, is a, a form of communication in a way that obviously it can, it can impact what people feel and think you know we watch um i mean we listen to old songs and it immediately brings back images of our past and a lot of scientists believe that the, the music and everything that your brain takes in is basically a wave or a frequency of some sort and that's how your brain works it works with frequency patterns you know because your eyes when when you look at something, your eyes obviously don't see a, a tile floor, for example. What your eye takes in is light, okay, as light waves, and it interprets the frequency data, and that's what your brain operates on, and that's how it recognizes patterns. It doesn't do, you know, like a comparison in your brain to a piece of tile, and it knows that it's tile. It works based on math. Uh, and that's how it works. And music, of course, is all about different frequencies. And the video I put out there has basically harmonics. And what a harmonic is, just in simple terms, you pick a, a note, okay, 
And then if you play it at a, another interval on top of itself, the two sound waves together merge, causing, you know, usually people do it because it sounds cool. It'll be a high pitch sound, but you could do low pitch or any pitch, you know, for, um, in music, uh, they have what they call the middle A and everybody tunes their instruments to the bands playing in tune. Uh, you'll tune usually to A4, which is the fourth octave. There, there are eight octaves and, um, and four is in the middle. That's what we call it, the middle. And they also have the middle C. So the A note itself is 440 hertz. So that when you get a tuning fork for like a guitar, if you bang the tuning fork, it vibrates at 440 hertz. And that's what you would tune your guitar to, one of your strings. And then you tune each string to each other to make sure that it's all in tune. Yeah, yeah, I knew five leaf would know about the brown note. Yeah, yeah. I you know, I I I think um you know I know what was that TV show um uh, Mythbusters they actually did a test and they put a bunch of people out there and they did the test and and I think at most um yeah people people felt nauseous and stuff yeah that's the middle C but some people also would say could say middle A when you're talking about the frequencies but um but yeah it's it's the middle C because of a, a, a pan a piano for example, you could play a piano or an organ. You played a middle C, and then the band could tune to that too. You could tune to anything, but but I mentioned I just mentioned uh, the A note because of the tuning forks, and of course, the guitars aren't aren't always in what they call standard tuning. And, and Five Leaf knows this. Yeah, hey Richard. Yeah, frequencies, man. It's all about the vibrations. I mean, it, it's serious. The, the stuff that that even Paul, to give him some credit. Paul and um, Shy Guy, Frank, and, you know, uh, Davio especially, the stuff that, and Street, of course, he's always talking about this kind of stuff. And now Davio's got, Davio's got me looking at the, uh, the pyramids and stuff like that. And, you know, I knew about the frequency, and I, I knew it before, but I didn't know the, the guy's name. His name is Christopher Dunn. Uh, he's a, a manufacturing engineer. He's got, like, 50 years of experience. Um, and, and primarily in aerospace uh, and, and uh, lasers and stuff, right? He's he's, he's a very smart guy. Um, he pu pu published a lot of articles, and um, he wrote a, a book called The Giza Power Plant. Um, and he's all about acoustic engineering, right? I'll show I'll show you a copy of his book. It's it's right here. Uh, I don't have the book, um, but you could you could certainly pick it up. It, it's relatively cheap. And it'll teach you what he believes. Now, out of all of the theories I've heard about the, why the the uh, you know the ley lines exist and why the pyramids are there, and communicating you know with basically outer space, his theory of how how what the pyramids are for, to me from a scientific perspective, makes the most sense. I agree with with Davio. Now, obviously, this is my my opinion, um, but. When you're looking at like history, like etymology, and you're going back to history and reading uh, various publications, all of those publications, of course, are, are based on math. So that's where the root of everything is, right? So everything, everything is based on frequency, and um, you know, that's just how things work. Um, and uh, the pyramids, according to him, they operate on a, on a what's called a coupled oscillator. Which basically means it's exactly like the guitar harmonics that I was showing before, but what you do is you have um, a, a room or some object, right? A big, let's call it a large object, okay? And when it vibrates, it vibrates at a very specific frequency, all right? But what you do is then you put another device in there and you make you make that vibrate to create a harmonic, okay? So the 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 thing in the pyramid, of course, would be a granite. Okay, so think of it as in, inside of a flute. Now I don't, I don't remember what, what what it's called. Uh, man, there's a name for it, but there's a a thing that you put inside a flute, and when you blow air through it, it vibrates, and that's what creates the frequency. So this thing is inside of a pyramid, right? So basically, what he believes is there's channels under the pyramid that they would get the water because there used to be a river there, would flow into the pyramid, and it would go down through a stone valve, and it caused the water to rapidly slap against basically a thin slab of, uh, 
of um, what is it called granite, and it would generate a frequency that would re reverberate off the frequency of a hey, kiwi, kiwi's road. Um, it would vibrate and then it would cause a sound wave. Okay, it, it's much much more deeper than that. I'm gonna get it because eventually he starts talking about how that sound will be projected as as a, essentially out into outer space. Okay. And um, it, it's really cool stuff. It's really cool stuff. So, yeah, basically, like I said, you know, I, I man, do you guys remember? What is that called inside of a, a flute? Uh, reed, reed, reed. Okay, R-E-E-D, I think. They put a reed in there, and the reed vibrates, okay, and it, and it changes the air, and how you finger the flute is going to determine the sound that's going to come out. So if you if you have a room, okay, like like when they're gonna have a concert, and this is what Davio did, I guess, and he, he knows a lot more about it than me. But basically, before a concert or whatever, or or what you know, they 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 adjust the levels and stuff, and they adjust um, the uh, the frequency through, through an equalizer, okay, to enhance or or remove certain frequencies so that it doesn't create basically fucked up noise because it, it'll bounce off the wall and and create something that's unpleasant to the ear so they're kind of you can think of it like they're tuning the room to the band okay it, it's a it's a complex process but the people that do that they, they know what they're doing um so with this guy um christopher dunn it, 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 there's a video i have let me show it to you um Right here, coupled oscillator. This is the video down here. You can see the link up here. It's uh, lowercase m, 6 S E M P X D S dash G. If you watch that video, it's pretty long, but basically uh, Christopher Dunn gives an explanation of, of what I'm talking about here and how the pyramids would work, and he considered them basically generators. They generate electricity. So, I mean, as you know, the whole Earth, we got magnetic fields around the Earth, and everything is, is controlled with magnetic pulses. And in nature, like I showed them, this is a, a fractal. Fractals are cool because it's a mathematical formula that basically will generate this pattern right here. But the cool thing about a fractal, or what they also call a Mandelbrot sets, and that's because the guy that named it was... Uh, his last name was Mandelbrot, and he was an int intellectual dude, and basically he discovered fractal geometry, right? So he discovered the math behind this, and you could zoom in infinitely on this image, and you'll see patterns that keep repeating over and over because it's a mathematical formula that's generating this. It's never, it's never going to change. It can go in infinitely. And... um. <clears throat> excuse me, like Street was talking about that coughing, you know, I mean, I know what smokers cough is, but he's right. I mean, like ever since like 2020, man, I cough all the time and I don't, I don't know what's going on, but it might also be just because simply my, uh, my, my mouth is dry, but, but yeah, so, so basically the, the idea is every, everything around us, if you zoom out of the earth and you look at how the rivers, uh, meander through a meadow, it generates mathematical patterns. If you look at a tree with no the branches with no leaves on it, the branches are all mathematical formulas that generate, right? So everything is basically based on math. That was like the root of everything. And to be honest with you, and this is just my opinion, my feeling, I believe that the written language was created just so that we could communicate with each other and explain math, you know? It's wonderful to go out there and do a lot of research on uh, like history, and it doesn't matter whether it's religion or or geographical or whatever you're doing. But um, if you want to truly understand what the actual people, quote unquote, that 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 form the basis of what you're reading, you have to understand the math, unfortunately, and um, and it, it, it's really cool, you know. It, it's um, Hey, see you later, Five Leaf. Uh, yeah, so 
it's really cool. And and at one point, right, I, I went for a job at uh, now, as you know, I mean, I, I meant primarily image and video processing, digital image processing is primarily what I did. I also did some device drivers and all of that stuff. So I went to Boeing for a job here uh, and um, I didn't get the job. The reason why I didn't get the job is purely because I don't have a degree, unfortunately, um, even though I've worked with the math that they're using and um that was quite a while ago and um like if somebody told me to implement um like a 4a transform i know how to do it okay and i've done it i mean if, if you want to write like an image uh processor you have to know how to do that because that's the basis for a lot of imaging functions um so you have to know how to do that but the point that they were trying to make at the uh, at um boeing well they didn't really make a point but i just realized myself what's going on the thing is if you don't really understand the the, the meaning behind something then you can't come up with your own derivatives of it right so you, you it's not just knowing how to implement an fft fast Fourier transform it's knowing what it does okay that's what's important if you don't know what it does and why it does it, then then you're not going to be able to be creative. And, and, you know, when I worked, we weren't just writing code like somebody came out and said, oh, you know, we, de we need to save an image to a disk or something. Um, that's trivial stuff that anybody can do. But when you're asked, hey, you know, we need to make a background eraser. <laughs> okay, something that eliminates or I can click on a tree and it removes it from a photograph. That's not something that, you know, if you're the first one to do it, you can't just go pick up a book and they're going to tell you how to do it. You know, and unfortunately, in programming today, that's essentially what people do. A lot of them, not all of them. But they'll go out there and they're what I call Googlers. They'll go out and they'll Google a formula, they'll download the, the source code, usually from open source, because it's free and you can get access to the code. And I, I like to refer to that as open source. Um, it's a great thing to share code and stuff like that, but unfortunately, a lot of people will take and, and they don't really understand uh, the methodology behind it or, or how it works. And um, so if you remove that person from the internet and they don't understand the math, they're basically not really a serious uh, person that's going to be able to, quote unquote, invent anything because they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're a coder. Let, I, that's a good word, a coder. They're not an engineer. They're they're a coder or a programmer. They're not an engineer. An engineer is going to implement something, and they know how it works. Hey, hey Kiwi. I mean, there's no problem with that at all. Hey, if somebody wants to learn programming, that's the best way to do it. Go look at other people that are doing. It. Go look at code. Go in there and make some changes. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Well, that's how everybody learns. I did the same thing way back in the day. Although there was no internet, I had to go. To a college and talk to other programmers or i had to go on the usenet and and um deal with binary groups and basically news groups and communicate with other people and there was no youtube i couldn't go out and watch videos i had to go and read books science books and, and things in the library and i had to do the work and and figure out the code and write it and trial and error and yeah that's how you learn but what i'm talking about are people that try to apply at a big job like that and and i at some of them companies i was part of the interview process and i wouldn't hire somebody like that and that's the main reason why we would test people away from a computer we want to see how they think not how they research and it doesn't necessarily matter what language they use um, because learning a new language is is easy to do what's more important is that they have problem solving skills that they could base on a solid foundation of whatever education that they had. And you'd be surprised at how many people you interview that can't even do the simplest thing once you take them away from the internet. And, you know, like I said, we, when you're working at a job like that, it's not just a programmer job, you're an, an inventor. And at Adobe, anyway, they like to call us, um, you know, uh, scientists, uh, digital imaging scientists, all right, or principal engineers. 
they don't just hire like anybody for a job like that. You have to you have to prove yourself. Um, it, it's very very hard and very very competitive. Um, a is also, and and honestly, it was extremely stressful for me. Hey, DP man, it was stressful because I was working with a bunch of PhDs and people that had far more knowledge than me. Um, but I felt the, the duty or the need to keep up with them. So after work, I would go home on my own time and study and do like the kind of stuff Candy's doing and research. And then I would write code and then I would talk to them if I needed to. <clears throat> but, but instead of looking at that as a disadvantage, I looked at it as an advantage because I didn't have any barriers. A lot of the PhDs, especially, you know, they, they had barriers and they couldn't think beyond those barriers. So a lot of times I would come up with a solution to a problem that they never would have thought of because they rule it out, um, you know, with their, their conscious rules it out. They're not thinking like as if they're, you know, with their subconscious thoughts or with the barrier. Because when you, when you, when you go into REM sleep, you, your, your subconscious takes over and, you know, there's no barriers. And a lot of like really important scientists and, you know, Tesla, Einstein, Edison, they would try to get to force themselves into um, a state like that where they would, like, let's say, force a lucid dream or whatever. And then they would make some kind of advice that would, like, a, they would hold a ball. And as soon as you fall asleep, you would drop the ball. It makes a sound, wakes you up. And then you instantly jot down whatever is in your brain. It doesn't matter how stupid it sounds. You write it down. And a lot of times they would go back and, and, and um, read what they wrote. And it solved problems. And the only reason why it solved the problems is because th there was no border. So I think that th it kind of helped me. And also it helped me keep in the game because I was always researching. So I was picking, because technology changes every day. But the guys who already had their PhD thought that, you know, a, a holier-than-thou attitude where I already know everything. I don't need to research it. So in some ways, in certain areas, I knew more, more about them. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I liked image processing because I liked working and seeing what you can do with, with frequency, basically frequency data. Um, I have an image here. I'll show you besides this Mandelbrot, uh, this image. Okay. They, they call her, I think her name is Lena or something like that, but it was a pretty old image. It goes way back to, um, either the seventies or an age, a black and white image. Um, they have an um, algorithm called, like I said before, an FFT, uh, a, a fast Fourier transform, or you can shorten it to FT, Fourier transform, French word, right? Um, but F actually stands for fast. It's a special implementation. And what it does is when you're looking at this image, it's what the, and they call the uh, time domain, okay? So what the FFT does is it converts this time-based um, signal into a frequency domain representation so that you can view it on a, what they call a spectrogram. This here is the result of an FFT on this image. So if you run an FFT on this image, this is the result. So a lot of image processing algorithms work in this domain, and then what they do is they do an inverse of that same operation to turn it back into the image. And now you have a processed image, okay? They don't process the pixels with, well, depending on what you're doing, if you're just scaling an image or something, there's certain algorithms that you would run just in the time domain. But 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 the bulk of the real cool stuff is in the frequency domain where you make your changes. And that's how, incidentally, um, JPEG sort of works. Um, like, for example, JPEG, JPEG uses a derivative called the DCT, which is a direct cosine transform. And what the direct uh, cosine transform will essentially do something similar to this, but it's lossy. Okay, it's, it's, it's going to quantize the image. What they do is, it, it, this is like the bulk of the compression. You could look at this, okay, and you could, you could discard frequencies. You could literally turn them into black in the in the here for example to make it in layman's terms it it removes them because your eye is not sensitive to certain frequency ranges 
that's where this chart comes in here. You can see we, we have the different frequencies, you know, um, everything vibrates at a cer certain frequency. The human brain even uh, runs at a certain frequency. I think it is nine megahertz. I mean, nine, yeah, not nine hertz or something. I mean, nine megahertz. I don't, it runs at some frequency, but everything, radios, um, cell phones, towers and everything. And then down here, if you look, you got like, these are radio frequencies or microwaves. Okay. And then it goes up into visible light. So this here is the only range you could see with your eyes, visible light. So everything in the rainbow is going to be within the visible light um, frequency spectrum, right? And then above that, you got ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, and so on and so forth. And down here, you got a representation of the frequency. So essentially, that's what this is here. This is a representation of this grayscale image within the visible range okay so it's it's really cool stuff and the ffd um is is not lossy i can i can take this image convert it to this and then convert it right back and and there's zero change it doesn't change anything in the image at all but a dct will because like i said it quantizes it and i think i talked about this in the other video i did with the birds in there but um you can do some really cool stuff with this, okay? The 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 difference between like an FFT and a, um, a DCT is that DCT uses real numbers while a FFT uses complex numbers. So, you know, they use it, like I said, for image compression, audio um, uh, processing, um, geology. I mean, it's it's used all over the place, right? And but like I said, the FFT is not lost. So it just it's just going to take the time domain and it's going to decompress it into the frequency domain, so that you can analyze different frequencies on a graph and change it. Right. So basically, what it's doing is it's decomposing this image into a bunch of sines and cosines of varying amplitudes and light and, and phases. Okay, of frequency. But that's how everything works out there. That's how magnetic fields work. That's how audio works. That's how light works. That's how the universe works. That's how everything, even DNA, everything can be can be transformed like that. So when you un when you really understand this, you could do some really cool stuff. Um, for example, if I wanted to, I could take like somebody's name, right, and I could put their name in here, right. And then I could run the inverse, and it would come up with an image, and you wouldn't even know that there's a name in there. You can scan those pixels all day long, and you're not going to find anything. Um, I mean, because even if you zoom in, because of the way um, this is in the time domain, and because of the aberrations that you're going to see based on how the sampling was done, you're not going to see it. And and I can tell you right now, like when, when we were at, um, I believe it was JASK, one of the guys on my team was working on um, scanner software. Let me uh, let me pop up the chat while I'm talking. Hey, Rob. Hey, Jupiter, Jody. He was working on scanner uh, software, and what he was doing was um, he had, when you want to take your software from the United States and export it, to Europe or to other countries, um, or you want to make a hardware Xerox machine, okay, and you want to sell that, um, the government, actually the banking industry, trust and love that, they, you actually have certain things you have to do in order to detect when people are copying or scanning money. And people don't know that this, this is going on in the background, but trust me, it's stored in the frequency domain whenever you scan something. And when you try to like pass that off as counterfeit and it's rescanned, they could find that information out there. They could even determine what scanner you used or what CCD it was captured on. There's a lot of forensics that you could do in the frequency domain. That's all I'm saying. So, like all that stuff that O was doing, he's looking at pixels and doing pixel to pixel comparison but he's working in the wrong domain when you're in this domain you could really see what's going on and see where there's aberrations 
And the other thing you could do is when somebody runs a cloning brush or something, for example, to clone areas of an image, to delete something, um, the pattern created by the algorithm used in the cloning brush could detect that same pattern in the frequency domain. So what it does, it detects it in the frequency domain, and when you do the inverse, it'll show you, you know, in those forensics programs where the changes are made. And there's no way that, that like, somebody that, that's just, let's say, uh, um, they use, like, they're a publisher or a graphic artist, and they use Photoshop all day long. They don't understand that. They're not working in that domain. They're working with the image. They're working on what's pleasing to the eye. But everything that they're doing in the image could be tracked. Well, I shouldn't say it like that because you can't track the steps they made. But there's certain, you could tell what if processing's been done in image by looking in the frequency domain. And the same thing with video because video is nothing more than a bunch of single frames rapidly played in, in sequence so that your eye in, uh, inter interpolates the difference from frame to frame and it looks like you have motion going on, which is another thing you can do with motion JPEG because. In the frequency domain, you can also detect motion. So if you look at this, like, for example, this is kind of interesting because, I mean, it kind of looks like the space, right? Space. That's not what it is. It's not supposed to be a bunch of stars and stuff like that. It just works out because of the way the light frequency is broken up. And you're seeing um, the, the varying levels of gray. So, like, black would be on one end of the spectrum. And then, let's say, white is on the other spectrum. And where they appear, if you were to look at like like we were talking about Euclidean geometry and stuff like that yesterday, if you if you look at it like that, you can think of like what quadrant things are in, and you can hide stuff in anything, and an amateur would never find it. And that's kind of what, what what I think I think shy guy or Frank knows what I'm talking about. Certainly Davio knows what I'm talking about. But that's why I was joking about um, Mario. It's not that I'm trying to pick on him, but. It doesn't work the way he's showing. You, you can't just do what he's doing. You have to have an algorithm that's going to produce predictable results given um, the same data. Um, and like he's getting various results, but mathematically, he's not doing it a way that like basically the science community would just disregard everything he's doing. He, he's not doing any um, kind of uh, cipher or anything like that. He's looking for synonyms and stuff like that. But the way he's extracting them out of the poem is not the correct way that you would do things. Because, I mean, right off the bat, you're taking 166 words and scramble it down into 24 words. That They're not even 24 words because you, you've removed all the words. There's no spacing. So you, so you end up with a block. Trying to teach Spanish by speaking Spanish. Yeah, no. I, I mean, you know, TP man, the thing is, um, I really, really enjoy science and I enjoy it because that's what I did, software engineering. And I believe that science and math is how you prove things. So if you're reading history, okay, you're reading like Euclidean geometry and stuff like that. Um, that's one thing, but actually understanding the math adds a lot more relevance to those documents because now you know exactly what they're talking about. So if you're trying to come up with a discovery on your own, if you don't understand what, what they're talking about, I mean, down at a mathematical level, it's hopeless that you're never going to discover anything, okay? So all you're doing is repeating discoveries that are already known. And that, was, that is what I believe that, um, that Shy Guy, Frank, and I were trying to, to relay in the conversation last night that um, where's the evidence and we were talking like that. that that's kind of what we mean. Um, you can't just come out and make a claim that something was discovered without actually have proving it. You know, that's that's the way things work in science. Unfortunately, there's no way to accurately do certain things, like like Shy Guy was saying, or or somebody, I don't remember who, when they were talking about the uh, cycles, when I asked them about the uh, our our uh, solar system, how much you know how quickly it rotates around the galaxy. And basically, if you look at the, the lifetime of our Earth, we've rotated around the galaxy, I believe, 12 times. And we, we go at a very fast speed. And I think it takes 300, I mean, 236 million years for our uh, 
our galaxy to make one complete rotation. I mean, for our solar system to make one complete rotation around our galaxy. Okay. I'm not talking about the universe, just our galaxy. So, so that means if it's only 200, well, only, only 236 million years, um, the earth is what, all, like 4 billion years old. So you just divide it. You can see how long we were here. But the problem is we can't go back farther than that. So at, what, what they're trying to do is, um, prediction but they're predicting it based on a you know a, a formula that they have some kind of uh a solid theory around and they're using it to predict the past or the future you know but w obviously we can't go back a hundred billion years ago um it's impossible there's there's no data you you can't get um factual data because it, it doesn't exist and that was why Davio said he's only concerned with right now, current day, and the future, because you can't do anything about the past that already happened. So why worry about it? You know, so so not all science is completely accurate. They tried to come up with a proof. Uh, you can't always do that because the data is not available. But you certainly have to convince the community that you have a thought a solid basis. And and that's what I'm calling an algorithm. You can't just go to somebody and say, Here's a random, you know, a block of, te of of gibberish, and I'm pulling words out of it because you can pull words all day. I mean, I joked around. I pulled Mario was wrong. And, of course, he told me, oh, well, you're not doing it right. But, no, it doesn't matter, like, how they're trying to do it and saying things need to touch and that. You need to actually have proof, a formula of some sorts that you're going to say, this is how it works. And this is in the poem. And Forrest Friend teaches you that formula. If you can't show that, then everything you're doing is completely unproven. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to bust on Mario, and I don't want to discuss it because it's a 100% waste of time. What he's doing is, is not going to get anybody anything. Uh, and I'm not saying all ciphers are like that. You know, for example, a five leaf has a pretty cool cipher. So if you want to, even though Forrest Fred said that don't use ciphers, if you want to do that, that's fine. But you got to use something that, that's provable and repeatable right you gotta you gotta give it various tests and you got to explain how and why it found what you're saying it found in the poem so like for example if it found street's email address then tell me how mathematically how did it find it? how does it work and that's where it, it all falls apart for them because they can't they can't explain it because in fact the matter is it, it's never going to be explainable because it doesn't work mathematically. Um, like I said, you could pull the wool over the eyes of a layman and it looks cool and people like cool things. You know, it's a mystery and all of that stuff, but you really should do your own homework and research things and you'll quickly discover that you shouldn't follow things that, are, that, that don't, don't make any sense because you're wasting your time. You have to be able to, to prove it in, in a way that it's repeatable. So let me look at the chat. No graph, nah, Richard, nah. <laughs> you know, I mean, Mario is not the first person to do that. You, you can go back and Google it. Go back on the Wayback Machine, and probably back since the, the day the poem came out, that's the first thing people did is look for anagrams and ciphers, and that's why Forrest Fenn came out with that comment that you're wasting your time, you're overcomplicating it. He says none of that stuff is needed. The only research you need is the thrill of the chase. And the thrill of the chase is going to provide hints to solve the clues that are in the poem that'll lead you directly to it. So once you solve the clues using the hints, the idea is that you then marry the clues to a map. Now you're ready, right? And do all of that from beginning to end until you come up with a precise location. Once you do that, you're ready to go boots on the ground. If you, if you don't do that, you're just going to have a wonderful vacation. You, you, nothing, right? Um, so what else we got Chicago right now it's cold yeah, it was actually cold last night here in Florida too when the levee breaks <laughs> that was cool though uh, so, so last night I mean I was really getting into that discussion I, I mean, that's where even uh, Paul came in when they were talking about what's going to happen to the earth and all that that stuff is definitely true 
That's not tinfoil hat. That's math. That's proven. It's going to happen. It's only a matter of when. And they're getting better and better at finding out the when. And depending on who you listen to, it's going to happen within five years. There's going to be a, um, a plume of radioactive waves that are going to shoot because they shoot out all the time out of the sun. So we rotate around the sun, right? So the, 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 it's only a matter of time when you rotate over one of those spots or a new spot forms and it sends out a blast like that. Um, it's going to completely wipe out the earth, wipe, literally rip, rip the, the earth off. Like Davio was saying, there's no way you're going to survive that. I don't care how rich you are. You're dead. Um, and the fact of the matter is they've proven, they've proven it. This doesn't have anything to do with man either. Like Davio said, um, this environmentalists out there with the green technology. So it's, it's a bunch of worse shit. It's all bogus. It's all lies. It's completely already proven false. Even George Carlin knew that. Go listen to him. He goes, you know, go look at those Mayans. I think he said frozen in time. He goes, so tell me, uh, they damaged the earth. You know, we got this big, powerful universe. And uh, one man, a man who's only been here for, uh, in our age, you know, would be roughly, I, I don't even know, a couple, I mean, I don't even, what is it, like 50,000 years or something, whatever. In our, not not over the whole time, but in our time, um, um, in, in just in North America alone, it's at least 15,000 years, right? But it, when you have something that's 4 billion years old and there's billions of objects created and destroyed every day out there, you ain't going to do shit to the earth. The only thing you can do is poison the ground and, and hurt the people that are here. But the inevitable is going to happen and the earth's going to get wiped out big time, big time. And um, some people think that, like I said, it happens every time we the earth uh, makes one revolution about the uh, galaxy. I mean, not, not the Earth, solar system, uh, makes one revolution around the galaxy, we go through a chain. So it's kind of like driving, like, like Street was saying, you're behind a jet. So you're, you're on, you got the jet fumes coming in front of you. When you make one revolution, you're kind of back where you were before, right? But, but, but the impact that you made before is still there magnetically or, or whatever in the sound waves. So when you come back, you can hit yourself, and uh, and that causes a disturbance or a ripple, which causes these events to happen on the sun or in the universe, and that's where we're constantly evolving over and over and over and over and over. You know, it probably it, it'll never end, right? Um, because there's other things happening too. Our galaxy is moving close to the nearest galaxy, so at some point, you know, billions of years from now, they're going to collide. And when they do, it's going to wipe out the entire the, the entire um, galaxy. Our galaxy will be will be gone. Um, you know, it doesn't matter who's here; you're gone. Um, but the Earth is like like Davia was saying. They believe that Mars once had all that water on it, once had a different landscape. But the Sun literally blew it off out in the space. It's, I mean, like a hair dryer. <laughs> like um, what's his name? Like um, George Carlin would say, woof, it's over in a split second. And you ain't going to do nothing about it. The magnetic poles are moving. When they flip, you're going to have major floods all over the earth. People are just instantly die. You know, and um, a lot of the stuff that you read, like, you know, you think about a religion and um, where they read about Noah's Ark and stuff like that in the Bible. I mean, some man didn't build an ark and bring all these animals on there and then a flooded and then he went that, that's not what happened man you know i mean it, it, they were probably going through a pole shift and it probably wiped everybody out or they learned of it from their ancestors and passed it along but they don't under, but not everybody understands the science so you could read that stuff and speculate all day long but if you can't mathematically have a proof of some sort then nobody's going to pay any attention you know, it's not the same thing as Forrest Fenn being an amateur because Forrest Fenn would still have to bring a proof. You don't need a sheepskin to prove something at all. Anybody can do it. You don't need to be a rocket science, but you do need to, if you want to research something, I would suggest if you really want to go get to the cool stuff, research math first. I mean, and believe me, that's hard, but it's something that you can, you can relatively easily learn. Do that before you do anything with languages and anything. 
because you're going to quickly find out when you get the languages and history that it's all based around math anyway. And then, as you know, the, 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 the alignment of the pyramids, how the pyramids are constructed, that was all math. And, and by the way, that same dude, um, what was his name again? This guy here, Christopher Dunn. I don't know if it's in this book. Like I said, I don't have it. Davio didn't leave any links, but not only does he discuss how the, how the uh, pyramids work with their function, um, he, they, he believes that these generated power and also they were a form of communication. But he also knows how they were built. And I thought this was really cool. And I don't know if this is in this book, but before I did any of this research on the pyramid and stuff like that, I was listening to Trusted Living and Street, and um, it was just the two of them. I don't think Candy was there that night. The Candy's like more focused on the history thing where I think Street and Trusted are more interested in like the language or the sciences part of it and, and how frequency and vibrations work and all of that stuff. And that's where I am too, because if you don't, I believe if you understand that, then you'll be able to understand what you're reading about. So anyway, when they were talking about it on the show, one of the things I mentioned in private emails to Street and Dustin is if you look at all these Egypt, you read all this text, and they'll tell you that the pyramids were built and these stones were cut by hand, or they're saying there was a machine that was water-powered that would make cuts, and um, all of that stuff is bullshit. All of it. There was no machines used to cut the fucking thing. They didn't do it by hand because somebody figured it out mathematically. If you take all these blocks and you tried to cut them by hand, it would have taken like a million years to construct just one pyramid. Like it's just completely impossible that it happened. Um, and also, they never found any tools that would work. They didn't have technology back then. So either the technology came from outer space or they did it another way. And they learn that technology. And that's where alchemy and stuff like that comes in that uh, Candy's talking about and Trust is talking about. Because tr Trusted is a bricklayer or a mason. And, and if you look at all the columns in Egypt where they have, or, or figures like lion heads, and snakes, and they have these huge columns made out of solid marble. And these things are perfectly created, right? Now you have curves. They're not even straight cuts. They're curves. So if you if you don't know the science, I think you have an advantage. Could go look in your backyard or go into a garden. You have all kinds of columns. You got little vase, vase or whatever. You've got all kinds of uh, little uh, statues and stuff that people make, and ninety nine percent of them were made by pouring concrete into a mold. So obviously. If you used alchemy and you knew how to make synthetic granite, okay, because granite requires a lot of heat to make, so it would have to be formed by lava and the earth. But you could synthetically make it using chemistry and dirt, right? Basically, sand. There's sand and chemistry. You could make you, you could make rock. We could make stone. Um, now, did they have technology to make the granite? Who knows? Who knows? But it's interesting that uh, I was watching a different scientist that did a, um, mic, uh, a magnetic, one of those really powerful, um, uh, not telescopes, really, microscope uh, analysis on the makeup, the chemical makeup of a lot of these things they found in Egypt. And he said that when you cut through them with a saw, okay, if you if you were to, to zoom in on granite, you would find, let's say, um, pieces of shell, okay, like a shell in there. You would find organic materials or, or compounds, metals, right, so on and so forth at a, at a microscopic level, right? Yeah, like the quartz. Now, if you were to cut it with a saw, it damages those molecules, rips them in half. Imagine taking, I mean, you can't, this is about the smallest thing you could, you could imagine, right? And you cut it in half. Well, You've taken a sphere or whatever, and you cut it in half. If you looked at it under a microscope, you could see where it was cut by a saw. Well, this guy went in there, and it, it could be cut by a saw because the stuff wasn't damaged. So, And also, they have rock that's bent. Bent. He, they can see it right where the saw line is, then it's bent. Almost like 
You know how when you take a knife, a butter knife, and you slide it through the butter? Because of when you push the knife into the butter, the butter needs to go somewhere. So it pushes up along the sides of the knives and it forms a V that sticks out. They actually found that. So that means that they, that somehow the granite, when they cut it, was superheated, almost like it was butter. But the interesting thing is if you make like a really, really powerful magnet, and there's videos on YouTube that show you how to do it, but it, it, be careful, it's dangerous. But you can take a rock or even granite and put it under there and melt the rock using just the sun. The problem is it, 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 it changes properties and it becomes a black liquid. I forgot what it's called off the top of my head now. So they didn't melt the granite. That's not how they did it. Th there's no way they could move that heavy weight around without machinery. So people were thinking aliens, and that's a possibility, yeah. But the other possibility is that the aliens or some other people in the past taught them how to pour the rock right in place. Now they don't need to move the granite. You just go up here, and they pour their concrete, these gigantic blocks. They didn't have to build, like, you know, and carry them up or use mules. That's, like, impossible. Some of them weigh so much weight. So the only logical and keep it simple stupid is that they poured it almost like it was concrete. They had a way using alchemy and, and certain stone, crushed ground stone or something like that, and they were essentially making synthetic granite. And they poured it into a friggin' mold. Or while it was still not cured, they would cut it at that point. Okay? Just like we make bricks today and cinder blocks and every building material, they probably did it the same way if you keep it simple, stupid. They didn't take these gigantic blocks. You know, the whole problem all along was that it's granite. You need like diamond blades to, and they didn't have diamonds in Egypt, right? They had other precious stones, but not diamonds, right? So if they did get diamonds in there, <clears throat> they would be so precious that in order to make a diamond bladed saw, like they didn't have enough diamonds there to do it because they did a test that if you cut just one, one rock, one rock from the pyramid would completely destroy the saw. It would cut it. I believe it'll take you like 20 days or something like that to cut one rock. And when you were done, you, you went through like a, an entire blade. So there's no way they were going through diamond blades and, you know, and doing that, you know, and if they did have any power tools to do fine detail, it's likely that the power source to operate those tools would have to be much more advanced than just the water wheel. So if they found a way to use the vibration of these pyramids, not only as a form of communication, but in order to operate equipment. Because they found drawings in some of these places that actually had like what looked like plugs where people were operating light bulbs off of a pyramid. So the, this guy is hypothesizing that these are not made to be burial tombs. These are actually power plants. It's a really, uh, I haven't read the book, but I'm watching that video, like I said here, um, this one here on, on YouTube. and you could. See the link up here um, if you want to go look at it. And um, it, 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 it's a long video, but he explains exactly everything that works. And I didn't finish it yet, so I don't know if he explains how the rocks are built and how they did it. But this guy has what I've seen the best, most logical explanation of all. It's, it's very, very cool stuff. For me, it's cool stuff. A lot of you guys might say, I, I don't care about that crap. I'd rather, and that's fine, you know. This is what I'm into because I like being able to do it and find out the what, the why, and all of that. Um, so yeah, this 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 guy here, um, check him out or check out that video. Um, oh, and by the way, since we were talking about writing, and Street's probably gonna like this one. I'm sure you guys have played the game, but they call it the telephone game. What you do is you line up like 10, 12 people, whatever, and you tell person number one a story. And then that person tells the story to person number two, number two, tells it to number three, who tells it to number four, and you work your way all down the line. And then you listen to the story at the final guy, the 20th guy or whatever. It's going to be completely different than the one that you first heard from. So that happened with history. That's the problem with looking at old documents like, you know, and that's what the, the, the Catholics and streets always talking about, where they took history that was already written and they just changed it. 
intentionally because they use it as a form of control. But the truth is all religions were used as a form of control all the way back as far as you would go. But it's interesting when you look at them all, they all had something in common and they were all tied to the same stars in the sky. And how would these people have possibly known what the stars are? And that, and that's like really, really cool stuff. So the problem is you get one religion because they're they get, remember too, they didn't even know how to write in, in our current age when it, when our current age started, when man first formed in Africa or whatever, um, they didn't know how to write. They communicated with hand signs and grunts. And then eventually they, they made symbols, right? And then eventually they made alphabets. And then eventually they added structure to it. And they ended up with words, and verbs, and, you know, phrases, and, and blah, blah, blah. And they added more and more structure to it because they realized that you can't, like if I was trying to explain, you know, the FFT, for example, to you, I can't grunt it. You're never going to understand it. And I can't do it with, um, without using some form of structure to the writing. So they have to add structure. Um, you know, so that's the problem with reading historical documents. You have to, you have to not only decode the document, but you got to actually use a scientific basis for it. You have to be able to prove that you can, you're not just going to convince somebody, oh yeah, this is the, this is the letter G. It's, it, it stood for God. Like then it doesn't work like that. Um, they had to prove why it would, would do that. And then they track it. And you're going through all these different languages, Hebrew and yada yada, all the way down. And but all the religions had every had certain things in common. They just worded it differently. So I look at that as the telephone game. Somebody started out, you know, fifty thousand years ago or whatever, a million years ago, caveman, I don't know. And then and then they uh they told somebody with, with uh, grunts. And then eventually somebody learned how to grunt better. So they told that person what their ancestry had. Oh, the grunt, 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 grunt. And then eventually somebody learned hand signs. And then they translated the hand sign. And then, like, you know, a couple hundred thousand years later, or whatever, they learned how to make symbols. So they translated it. But all along the way, you've been losing data or all data has been altered. That's what, that's where science comes in. And that's where you need to prove it. Hey, street. Talking about last night, man, I had a really good time. I mean, especially with uh, when you guys were talking about the pyramids and stuff with Davio and um, and uh, Shy Guy, Frank. I, I, I like science, and that's why I enjoyed that the most. And you know, so I've been I've been watching a video today about uh, Christopher Dunn that because uh, Davio, man, you didn't leave the links for Street. So uh, anyway, I found this video. I'll probably end up buying the book on Amazon and reading it. But I remember Street was talking about that, you know, the vibrations and stuff. Well, now that I've been watching this video that Street probably already watched about the coupled oscillator and how the water flow would bang against the water would add a valve in there would quickly bounce quickly as if it was like a reed in the flute, and it would generate a harmonic that that was um, an integral an integral of the uh, the 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 frequency that the room itself was tuned to and then it would then distribute that or generate power generate a ray out of it um i thought that that was really 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 cool video there um and then street eventually i got to uh this stuff here where i was talking how um how things work like this image here is in the time domain okay so when you're in like photoshop or whatever a lot of people would use the clone brush or um, you know, they'll change certain attributes with the uh, image and move things around and smooth it out, whatever. Well, a lot of the stuff that you're doing behind the scenes, not all of it, but a lot of it, what they do is they run what they call a, a Fourier transform, and it transforms from the time domain to a frequency domain, okay? This image here, Street, is identical to this image here. The difference is that this is frequency data, and you got clusters based on the wavelengths. Of course, of course, this, all of these frequencies here are going to fall within the realm of visible light. So they're all going to be within that part of the spectrum. But you got ultraviolet, x-rays, and so on. And that's where that other guy comes in, the laser beams and 
blah, 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 because it's, it's all based on the same thing. And you got sound, and you know. <clears throat> so basically, um, street, and you, you may or may not already know this. Most people don't know it, but an FFT is not a, uh, it's lossless. I can, I can take this and turn it into this and then turn it right back. And, and you can compare pixel by pixel and nothing will be different. So a lot of the algorithms that use to modify an image or compress an image are done in this domain because I can make changes here that will impact it when you do the inverse transform. And the other thing I can do is I can break this spectrum into, into what's visible and not visible, and your eye is more sensitive to certain colors so or certain um, levels of luminance, okay? So I can delete a whole bunch of that data around here Right, and then and then convert it back over, and to do that, they use what they call a DCT, discrete cosine transform. So, because all the all this stuff is that you're looking at here is a bunch of sines and cosines, which, as you know, all work with pi, all have to do with circles, it all has to do with geometry. So, this is what everything, including the human brain, is based on frequency data. So, the cool thing is, street, that you could you could do cool things. I could put something in this frequency data. And do the inverse, and you won't even know it's in the image. Unless you converted it back, then you'd be able to determine it, what was in there. Yes, if you do a pixel to pixel comparison, it will be different, and you can pick it up that way. But, but the problem is, because of the JPEG compression, you're not going to be able to do that. And when you find the data, you ain't going to be able to make any sense out of it. They're going to look like noise to you. Like you'll, you'll think the CCD was bad or something. But if you do it back in the frequency domain, you can see it, it says Troy in there. Or it has copyright, Troy Barlow. Or it's got a serial number from a dollar bill. Or a serial number in a treasure chest. Or something like that. That somebody who operates radio equipment would know about frequencies and how the frequency domain works. Okay? Hint, hint. But um, it, it's, it's, it's really cool. And, I mean, that's why I like science. Street. It's not that I don't like the story, you know, about religions and the, the grail and the Emma ring. I'm not as interested in that as I am about the science because the science is where it's at. That's where you're going to make your earth shattering discoveries and discover aliens and stuff. If you go back and read, um, just reading, um, alone, you're reading someone's interpretation of it. You're not reading the foundation. And I like to see the foundation because I want to know why. Why did they say that? Because a lot of times, like I said, when you came here, it was just a, it's a telephone game. At the, let me look here a little bit. Pictographs, petroglyphs. Yeah, Street, I was showing it's the same thing here, Street. This is a, Mandel, a Mandelbrot set named after a guy whose last name is Mandelbrot. This is a fractal. And these patterns that it generates are, if as long as you run the same um, function on it, you're always going to get this pattern. But the cool thing is you could zoom in on this infinitely. I don't care, forever. You can just keep zooming and zooming and zooming in. And the patterns that it reveals are always going to be the same. It'll never change. So when I'm at this level, it'll be like this. If I zoom in a million times, it's not going to look like this, but the patterns, it's going to be repeatable over and over and over. It never changes, right? And if you look at this, doesn't this look like a river? So, so the earth, the environment operates like a fractal. It's all math based. These are river, rivers, creeks, streams. They can be branches on a tree. If you look at a leaf under a microscope, it's got all the same things. Look at a snowflake, patterns in the snow. Everything around us is, is based on math. The only reason we even came up with written language is so that we could talk about the math. And when I say we, I mean the science community. Obviously, you know, other literature and poetry went off on its own way. It's not science-based, so they made changes uh, for reasons of literature. But music is the same thing, Street. That's why I did that video today. It's the same thing. You know, a harmonic is when you take a bass frequency and then you find a multiple of that frequency and you play that same tone and you play those two tones in and, and, uh, simultaneously, it generates a certain wave that generates a harmonic. And you could, you could obviously communicate using waves like that because you could make music and 
So even music itself is based on on math and on patterns and stuff like this. Uh, so they knew that, and obviously people then derived it to use it for uh, for uh, entertainment reasons. But but uh, but yeah, I mean, and the other thing, like you know, um, music. And Sri, you're going to laugh at this one. Music obviously impacts you. You know, I know, and I'm sure every one of you, if you flip on the radio and you hear a song that reminds me of you of some time when you were a teenager, in in nanoseconds, an image is going to appear in your freaking head of some time, maybe with your family member, with a um, your wife or your ex girlfriend or whatever. It's going to bring back a memory and the the brain operates with vibration too. So the theory is obviously if I take a picture, okay, your brain doesn't remember it as a picture, but it does remember the frequency data. So when you're looking at an image, okay, it generates through the light coming in your eye, it generates frequency patterns in your brain that cause it to reconstruct that image on a fly. It doesn't have to store it. It's not like your brain is like a hard drive. That's amateur technology. No, no, no. This is more like artificial intelligence that when you repeat the same algorithm, that same algorithm is going to generate that same image all the time in your brain, right? And, and that's how music works. When, when you generate music, it, it's going to vibrate. It causes a vibration. It's going to make you feel good. It can make you feel sad. It can make you feel brave, take a risk. And they even experimented during wars with sound control. They would they would play over loudspeakers certain tones that can cause problems with people. And Street, that was a funny part. I joked in the description of that video that I made that I put the brown note in there. <laughs> the brown note is a frequency, I think it's from what, like two to six hertz. Or, or no, six to nine, I don't know, five to nine, something like that. And the brown note, they, they used to say that can cause you to lose control of your bowels. In other words, when you hear that a certain tone, it triggers your mind to do something. So they know, and this is actually mathematically proven, not, not, not the brown tone. That was, that's a myth joke. Actually, it probably does exist, but they, they don't know what the frequency is. The myth busters tested it. They tried to make people shit their pants and it didn't happen. But the funny, the funny thing about it is that it, it's true. You, your brain is communicating with your heart, telling it to beat. Your brain's communicating with everything in your body, the muscles, everything, your nerves. So if you know what that frequency is, you can control it and you can alter it. If you project it as sound or if you projected it as light coming in as an image. And this is the kind of technology that you're going to learn from a quote unquote alien source. This is, but the only way you're going to, you're going to be able to do cool stuff with that is if you understand how it works. And that's why. I'm interested in it. So no, there's no brown note in the, in the video. If there was, it would be you know, it's not going to do anything. But they, but but it is a fact. If if they found a way, now think about this. Your your brain doesn't. It's not a memory. You don't you don't. You might have short term memory, but for the long term, what it would be memorizing is the math or the algorithm to reconstruct this. It doesn't have to compress it or remember the image itself. <clears throat> so now think about what that means, okay? If I want you to see something, a very specific thing, I want you to see it, all I need to do is construct it in the frequency data and then convert that sequence, the frequency data over to light and project it on you. And I can make you see whatever you, whatever I want. Obviously, we're not really completely at that the point of doing that yet, like Davio hinted at, but that's where people like Elon Musk want to go. But that's how they believe um, aliens travel and stuff like that. It's not like they, they actually have to do anything. They don't make a spaceship and fly somewhere. They don't have to do that. Okay. The, it, maybe, you know, it has something to do with, the, well, no, not maybe. It definitely has something to do with what we're, we're talking about here. That's why I find it fascinating because if you don't understand this, it's completely impossible for you to understand it by just looking at old documents because. First of all, the documents that explain this stuff, they don't exist because it's going to be censored and they're going to prevent you from seeing it because it reveals more than they want to tell you. But if you understand the math, you can figure it out yourself, right? 
And that's exactly what people like the troubadours or something like that may have done. And that's what I was hinting at in Steve's show. And I think that's what Shy Guy was talking to, too, when we were saying that where's the proof, you know, the evidence. You would have to show evidence like like if I want to reconstruct this here and I want to prove it to you, I can give you the code that generates this image. And and not only does it generate this image, like I said, you could zoom in infinitely and it'll generate the same patterns for you that it does for me. If if you have an algorithm like Mario's and it doesn't work that way, then it's it's bogus. It it just doesn't work. He he's randomly pulling words, you know. And again, no offense, Mario, but I had to say it, and it's a great example to prove my point. Um, let's see what's going. And by the way, I said at the very beginning, and nobody was here, but you don't need to know any of this stuff to solve the poem. Um, the only reason why you would want to know this is if you want to take it beyond forest, right? Like beyond the chase, and you you're really interested in. How do we learn? How did they build the pyramids? How does sound work? How does light work? And and if you're if you're into that kind of stuff and you like to solve problems and stuff, th this is the cool cool thing. It's not going to help you solve the poem. You don't need to know any of this. Did Forrest Fenn know any of this stuff? Yeah, sure he did. He was a radio operator. He knows the math behind it. Um, and I'm sure that as he got older and the internet became prevalent, he probably spent a lot of time on there and he learned a lot of stuff. Um, and he probably he could have figured out ways to do this kind of stuff. And if you could figure out something down at that math level like that, that that is earth shattering. That that's that's major. Hey, um, did he do something like that? Probably not. He didn't discover something that's going to be the key to the universe. But it's more likely he discovered something that would have something to do with religion, like Street said, or or something to do, you know, what what happened at that time. But I believe that the way it originated, Forrest Fenn was probably, and I'm sure some people disagree, but Forrest Fenn had his eyes on the gold. He wanted to track the Spanish for the gold. He's giving you title of the gold. It's all about, not, not the box of gold you put out, but he was looking for the Spanish gold. And then obviously, as a side effect, he's also going to learn about where the artifacts are and where he can make discoveries of pottery and what what have, what have you? So he was clearly had an agenda when they were tracing it back from Cozumel. Clearly, he was doing that. But I think initially they were there at Cozumel because that's where the Spanish landed. One of the places the Spanish landed when they attacked the Mayans, and he was looking for specifically Mayan technology and then and the um, you know where the Spanish bought the gold because that's why they came here. There were no metals here; it was stone and wood. You know, I mean. And then the uh, Spanish came here, and all of a sudden we had metals and precious metals, and that's what he was looking for, in my opinion. Um, but don't don't kid yourself. Don't think that that Boris was Mister Innocent. You know, all about archaeology. He had gold on the mind because if you could find any kind of map or anything where the conquistadors stockpiled gold, you're going to be filthy rich. Um, you know, and of course it benefits him anyway because even if he don't find the gold. He's going to find ancient maps, or he's going to find scrolls. He's going to find knowledge that's going to lead him to things that he could discover that are really cool. I mean, so that's why he did it. Yeah, brain, heart frequency—it's all part of your voice. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, something you, when you're in a movie and they're playing certain sounds, certain notes, like all right, like a musical scale. The minor scales are, tend to be sad. When they want to make you sad, they'll play something in a minor key. And the, and the key they choose is going to be based on who's doing the singing or, or what, what instruments they're using, but they'll play it in a minor scale. Um, you know, and then they have the major scale. They have different scales that they'll do things. Certain harmonies created by certain sequences of notes triggers your body to feel a certain way, and that's exactly what they do in rooms. And like I was saying real big before that, that's what Davio did. When they were doing a concert, what you do is you go in to uh, – um, the, the the venue and you use an equalizer to 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 measure the sound levels coming back at you and you tune the the with using the equalizer to the room so because if you don't do that them harmonics that we're talking about where where when you want to get a perfect harmonic it's got to be an exact interval uh, it can't be like if you don't get the uh, the correct interval 
depending on how many octaves up, octaves up you want it to be, you're going to create noise that doesn't sound good or vibrating or it's going to it's going to actually irritate people. So they tune it to try to reduce the harmonics that that they don't want and enhance what they do want. And and a lot of those guys, that's probably why uh, Davio's into this. Cool, really, really cool stuff. That yeah, I mean, it, I, Davio probably had a cool job, but I mean, that's why I got into programming exactly for this reason. I was like, when I was a kid, I used to like tearing things apart and putting them back together and seeing how it worked. I was kind of like Skippy, not like Boris. And then when computers came around, even in the late eight, late seventies, when we had. Um, in television, it used to, it came out a cartridge called the basic cartridge and you could do basic programming. And I learned that. And then, and then when the computers came out in the early eighties, the eight bit machines, I was like, wow, here's a machine I can buy and I can make that machine do whatever I want. Right. And not something bad, but I'm saying I can make, if I want to calculate, you know, whatever I want to do, I can do it. So I learned how to program and then. The computers got more and more powerful, and then I see what you could do with audio and graphics, and I'm like, that's where I want to be. You know, I like doing the three. I worked on 3D ray tracing software, and all graphics and video all along, and that's where I was. Sound is good too, but the problem with sound is your eye is less sensitive to change than your ears are. If you if you make a mistake or you have a bug in your code and it fucks up the sound. It's going to be audible as like a pop or something like that. And it, it, it's not acceptable. But if I make an, a mistake that fucks up a few pixels in an image, nobody's going to notice it. Right. So when you're first learning it, but audio is really hard to work with because you're hearing it through your ear. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could, and that's the other thing. If you do the algorithm wrong, like when you're mixing channels, a left and a right channel or mixing for stereo, if you don't get it right, you're going to create artificial harmonics, shit that don't even exist in the sound. You can make your own stuff appear in there, and it's very, very unpleasant. Very unpleasant. Uh, it's really hard to work with audio like that. But it, but either way, I mean, that's that's what I thought was cool. And I'm like, hey, man, I, I could do this at home on my desk, and that's why I became a programmer. And I'm like, what other field could you do that? I don't. I'd like to be an archaeologist, but I, I can't afford to travel the world. And, and buy all those tools, you know. Here, I don't need anything. I just need a computer and a desk and some electricity. And I was able to have a lot of fun with it and turn it into a career. And that's exactly what I did. Um, but I, I, I think analytics is fun. I, I, like, like I said, it all started with tearing stuff apart and building it together. And I took some risks, man. Especially, I think I was like 14, I actually changed the picture tube in the, in the TV. And it was working. I couldn't get the picture totally right because when you do that, you got to make a lot of adjustments, especially on the magnet that uh, in the area in the back of the vacuum tube. I mean, the, the picture tube. <clears throat> but and I knew there's high voltage in there, but like I didn't really understand anything when I was like 12, 13 years old. I mean, you can kill yourself like that. Uh, you have to. It's like a giant capacitor, and if you don't discharge the picture tube, right. And and you fuck around with it. The, it there's a there's going to be a, um, a wire plugged into the side of it. You fuck around with that thing, you will kill yourself if you don't. What you're supposed to do is discharge it. You got to ground it, leave it grounded for a while, discharge the capacitor. You know, all capacitors are like that. So like, if you go out like, and there's a down power wire, and they turn the power off, and you know there's no power in the wire, that doesn't mean anything. There could be power. There could be a relay or something in there, and there's power sitting behind a capacitor and you go in there and the relay pops let's say it was stuck the relay pops the capacitor is going to discharge on you and you just killed yourself if there's enough amps it's not the volts that kill you it's the amps amps kill volt you could you could probably take a you know million volts get it with lightning and it's not going to kill you but it's going to burn you severely but if you're depending on how it hit you and how the power arc through you it may not kill you um if it went like arm to arm, it's probably going to kill you because it's going to go right through, right across the chest, and you're dead. Um, there you go. So, so ACDC, a high voltage, or what's that? What's the other song? The the recent one um, that they have. Can't remember the name of the song now. Jesus Christ, man! I hate getting old. 
Yeah, I guess if you hit that high voltage, man, you could be on the highway to hell, too. Hi, Lula Bell. Ain't a secret. Yeah. No, like I said, I mean, I know people can watch it. Oh, it says nothing, nothing to do with Forrest Men's um, poem. You don't need to, and not, not even close would you need to do this. Nor do you need to go and study Hebrew and, and go and Spain and all, you don't need to do all that stuff. You do that when you enjoy it. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. But did he require that to solve the poem? I don't believe so. I can't prove that, but I mean, some people think you do. That could be true. Maybe the 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 lure, the treasure chest, was very easy, and the poem leads right to it. But if you want to find the information that's going to change history as we know it, yeah, you have to do work like this. But um, you wouldn't have to do the math. But like I said, I enjoy the math better because using the math, I'm going to understand the documents I read if I'm reading about Euclidean geometry and stuff like that. If you don't understand the math, you can read the documents all day long. All they're going to tell you is what the author's telling you. I could look at it and I could see what the author didn't tell me because if I understand the math. Um, now, no offense, again, to people that do that. Everybody has something different. I find this far more fascinating. And and speaking of Forrest Fenn's poem and, and San Lazaro and all that, like I said, I believe that my solve is right, 100%. And I think that that's where the treasure chest that Jack found was. And either he found it there or it was moved. I believe that that if if he did find it there, like let's say I went there before it was found and I found it there, I believe that in the top of the treasure chest, there was a title. And I said this in 2018 on AGK show, there's a title. And I believe the title sent you and gave you access to the real trove. Now, where that real trove is, I didn't know, nor did I care, because when I find the treasure chest, it's going to tell me where it is. <clears throat> That's the way I looked at it. But now that I've been talking the street, I believe that the real trove of knowledge is down in San Lazaro. So now I'm going to say that that's where that that um, title would have led me down there, and I would know exactly where to go. Okay, but because Forrest Fenn had a plan to end, he thought of everything, so he had a plan in there to end it. So what could have happened is he went up there, told Shiloh or somebody, "Go retrieve the chest, take the take this op, the title out of it, whatever it was in there, the thing he never wanted to talk about, take it out." And bring that back to me, and then take the, the remaining treasure chest, which is the gold in there, and put it here, so that people could find it. Because we're we're going to end this chase, right? So he makes it easier to find because nobody's finding it yet, right? Nobody has a a complete solve yet, including me, because I didn't. Nobody did. But when they moved it, they took that out of there because they wanted to make sure that whoever found the lure or the door prize cannot find the trove. Only the solver can. So, yeah, so, so um, oh, I, oh, you're talking to somebody else. Yeah, so that's what I believe happened. So you're down, you're down, now you're in San Lazaro, and that's where the real knowledge is. That's where the, uh, the it's going to change history, uh, you know. So I believe the medicine wheel was part of that because there are major, major connections and I'm not, to San Lazaro. And I never went over those. Maybe someday I'll do a video about that. but. Obviously, there's major connections to the book, and there's major connections to space, and we got Lovell, and we got the astronaut landing on the moon, and J all of that stuff. Even JFK, all of that could be tied into that spot. And um, and also, that's earlier in time, right? So that might be, tre you know, treasure, treasures new or whatever or old. And then you get down to San Lazaro. That that if the wheel is twelve thousand years old or a thousand years old. When you're down in San Lazaro, you're talking about, you know, 600 years or whatever. So now that would be, you know, another treasure. I believe there was two because he had two Omegas. Um, I always thought that. Now I think it even more. Um, because it wasn't about the gold, like Candy like to say. It wasn't about the treasure chest with filled with gold. It's about the knowledge. It's about, the you know, and I believe the way you gain access to that is through the title and i believe it was probably on private property or some property could even be san lazaro although, although i doubt it 
some property that you would need that title in order to gain access to it. That's how he knew nobody would stumble on the trove. You might stumble on the treasure chest, but you're not going to stumble on the trove. That's how he knew it, because the only way to get to the real knowledge is you have to have the title, period, or you, you can't go there. And the reason why I don't believe it's, it is physically at San Lazaro is because, let's be real here, Forrest Fenn was raided in 1979, probably because they want to know what his brother found in 1978, so they went to his um, gallery and raided that. But who knows? That's a speculation. But he was raided in 79. So four years later, Forrest Fenn buys San Lazaro, right? Now, he starts digging in a, a, a year and a half or whatever after that. So we're approaching eight, 1986. And he tells you right there in that video I showed you that he found something. He found knowledge, right? Physical knowledge. Physical knowledge. Um, and he took it. He tells you he took it. And then he tells you that there's probably more. <laughs> he says, he shows you four other keys. He goes, probably more. And if you find that, that will, you know, he goes, that, that, that could change. And he goes, no, that will. I know that that will change history as we know it. So. He probably took it out of San Lazaro and moved it somewhere else, maybe in the mountains, maybe on a piece of property he owns. And then you get to there um, by, by you know, in New, it's in New Mexico or maybe it's in Colorado. I don't know. I, I tend to think probably New Mexico. But is it at, physically at San Lazaro? No, no. But the key to solving it is to understanding the meaning of why San Lazaro was there, or more importantly, not necessarily the, uh, the history behind it, but the history after it. Because when people fled San Lazaro, they fled up to um, Four Corners, which is where Mesa Verde is, which is where he got the bracelet. So he was obviously chasing people north, and I believe that that was another hint of, to why, um, why you know, he discussed the Spanish armor and Kerwin and blah, blah, blah. So he was currently, obviously, chasing that around. So the question is, what knowledge did he find? I believe it's physical. I don't know if Street and Candy think it's physical, but to me, it's physical. Because if, it, if it's not, that would be kind of like me telling you, okay, uh, guys, I, you know, I solved the poem, I found the trove, I found the knowledge, and I'm not going to tell you. Like, so how did I change history if I don't tell you? And if I told you and you asked me, Troy, how how'd you find that? How do I do it? And I said, go solve the poem. Or go figure it out. You'd beat the shit out of me. I mean, you'd be like, "Well, why are you bragging everybody you found it when you can't? When you're not going to tell us?" So, if he wanted to change history, and this is my opinion, he would have done it, and he would have he would have passed it along in a physical manner, just like he said in the video. He goes, um, "He found ledgers and scrolls, you know, and notes and probably maps, whatever the hell he found in there in that box. Those are physical things he's talking about." <clears throat> so if he was going to take it with him when he died, after he's dead, there's no way to pass that along. And yes, at that point, you would have to, to solve the poem and everything to get it. But in order for you to, to keep passing it along, I believe it was a physical thing that he transferred. Because if it was in his mind, okay, then there's no way he's going to pass it to somebody else. And I don't think that he required Because why would you go through all the trouble to solve the poem to find it, and then you don't get anything? Like, it you got more research to do. I don't believe that. Now, I'm not saying that that's wrong. That's kind of what caused the argument last night. That could be true, but I happen to disagree with it. And when I disagree with something, you know, that's fine, but people should respect that. You disagree with it, you know, um, because nobody can claim they're right at this point. You know, Candy can't come out and say, I know that, you know, no, you don't know. Um, I can't come out and say, I know it's physical. Because, no, I don't know. The only person who knows is the person who saw the poem. Nobody else knows except Forrest. He was dead. I don't believe the family knows. I honestly don't. You know. So it's, I, I believe, yes, yeah, Street. I think it's a physical. It, 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 it's probably exactly what he said. It's probably a wooden box. And it's probably buried outside of metal detector range. So that the only way you can get it is by solving the poem. And I believe that it solves to somewhere in New Mexico. But who knows? It could solve to Colorado or, well, I don't think so. I think that, I think the treasure, the lure was up there and then it sends you, it sends you through the title down 
and it probably sent you to directly where, where that box is. Now, obviously, if he ended it, he had an exit plan. So how did he implement the exit plan? We don't know. Now, maybe Silo is part of the exit plan, and Silo's going to do something with that title. We don't know. I mean, that's what I think. But I think ultimately, there's not going to be any more money. Like, Silo's not going to come out and say, Forrest hit another chest of a million dollars. No, he didn't. This is all about knowledge, like Street said at this point. This is the, this is the part that could, could last thousands of years, I believe, right? So, it would be cool nonetheless. I, at least I think so. But having said that, am I going to physically go to New Mexico looking for stuff? No, I'm not. But what I will do is, just like I've been doing with my solve, if I find anything about that, I, that I think might be helpful to somebody, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's street candy. You know, uh, it could be Barbara. It could be Dave Woodard. I, I don't anybody. Anybody that's looking in uh, New Mexico, if you find my information that I put out useful, that power to you. If you go there and find a trove of knowledge, and then you break history, and I don't power to you. I don't. I don't really care. I'm not going to go there and look for it. Because because it, it's because it, of two reasons one I don't have the money and two I, frankly I think it's going to be really difficult to find it I don't think it's going to be something you're going to do overnight and third I kind of agree with Street I got this feeling that what you find if you were to reveal it, it it's not going to be it's going to be Pandora's box um, and that is exactly why I think Forrest Fenn said. I don't want nothing. It's out of my hands. I hit it. Whoever finds it, you better put it. Think about it because you got a big decision. Now, is it something like Forrest Fenn shot JFK? No, no, no. I don't believe that. Um, does Forrest Fenn have evidence to that effect? Maybe. That would be dangerous. Uh, was it D.B. Cooper? No. Nope. Matter of fact, somebody I know uh, said, I don't know who it was that said this. But they talked to one of the stewardesses that was on there and showed them a picture of both Forrest and Skippy, and they said, nope, wasn't either one of them. So that's what, that's been disproven. He he wasn't Cooper. That's you know, he, Maybe he was. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't really care. You know, I'm not going to research it. I'm certainly not going to research anything to do with uh, assassination. Um, I don't want to be on the FBI's list of people to watch. Um, I'd rather look on something that, you know, Religion, if it came out and it, it destroyed the Catholic religion, yeah, I, I might release something like that out of spite. Because like I was saying to Candy yesterday, Forrest Fem didn't teach me anything about religion um, and about how not to pay attention and how they're indoctrinating you and how they're using a form of control. I, maybe I just, from Street and I being older, that was the way we were raised to, to be thinkers. I knew that all along. I, this isn't earth shattering. Like Forrest Fenn didn't come have to come out and tell me, "It's why our government's fucked up, and they're in bed with the uh, the church, and they're causing all." If Forrest Fenn didn't have to tell me that. I'm not a blind. I knew that a long time. Not he knew it before me because he's older. That's the only reason why. What Forrest Fenn taught me, and because I, I don't want to make it sound like he didn't teach me anything, he certainly did. He he pushed me back to because I was actually down. I was like. Man, I mean, I was losing my career. I was in the friggin' hospital. I, I lost my job. I, I lost almost all of my retirement money, and um, well, I had all kinds of issues. I, for the last eight years, I've been going to the doctors, three different, four different doctors, every three months, nonstop. Every three months, I got to go for all these fucking blood tests and all this shit, over and over and over. And I had problems with my white blood cell count. At one point, they thought it might be cancer. Um, so they wouldn't let me travel. That was in 2017. So I, I had all those problems, and Forrest Fenn took me away from that, and he took me back to the way I used to feel in the 80s when I was looking at stuff like this and what got me into it in the first place. And the other thing Forrest Fenn did for me that I, uh, that I love is that he taught me about what I didn't know about the, the Plains Indians and the Natives, um, you know, how the the migration occurred when people came across Siberia, I learned that when I was in school. That wasn't forced to teach me that. But in archaeology, I mean, that's the study of the past. And anthropology is the study of the people. 
So an anthropologist and an archaeologist would go together. Of course, didn't teach me that either. But before his friend did teach me is, like I said, go out and see it yourself. Go there. Go to Wyoming. See how the Indians live. And I did. I drove through the Wind River Reservation. I seen it firsthand. I seen how our, our environment is getting destroyed. I seen that. So he achieved that goal, and he made me want to look into it more. And now I want to help the underprivileged natives that are in this country and i don't care whether you're mexican or or a plains indian or whatever if you're young and you're and and you don't have the money to pay for things or you you don't can't afford a good education i can, i don't have any money i'm not rich but i am certainly willing to sit here like i am now and work with a group of children and i'll take them and show them virtually we can develop a game or something that they would have fun with I'll show them how to make the artwork, the sprites, the sounds, the music, whatever. We'll have fun with it. They they do the creating. I'll just tell them how to do it, and I'll handle all the technical details. And then I'll teach them how to program the game, and then I'll show them how to put it on Steam or on Amazon so that they can make money. I'll work with my partner. We'll get Apple or fucking somebody to to um, to uh, help you know fund anything that needs to be funding, like if we need to do Skype sessions or whatever. That's what I'll do. You know, I have no problem investing, giving my time. That's what I've done all my life. I don't just sit back and write a check and give it to uh, UNICEF or something. I actually get my big ass out of the chair and go down there and put hands on and I'll help out. I'll, I'll collect tickets or, you know, sell soda to the kids or run one of the rides or be there on the fire truck that's what i, I how i grew up go oh, you want to go help people go and do it and and i didn't do that because i learned that from my parents i did it because my brother was handicapped he almost died when he was born he had that major surgery and, and he's handicapped not disabled he's handicapped right May, in a major way i'm not going to get into it but i mean i helped him and he's in special olympics and we would take the kids that are in the, uh, the, the the homes where they have kids that are staying with other handicapped kids, and we would take them out, just like Forrest did. We would take those children out, and we would we would make a carnival for them. We would have games and lawn darts, you know, our, our track races, stuff that wheelchair races. I mean, and just to see the smile on the kids' faces when you were out there doing it, right? And I knew that my dedication – wasn't putting money in the hands like what organization is that it might have been unicef or united way one of them got busted because the ceo they only give like one percent of the money to the needy the cancer funds and all that these uh not-for-profits are designed to line the pockets of the ceos and they can kiss my ass the same thing with the indians i'm not going to give money to a tribe because it's going to go right to the tribe leaders i want to be able to to directly help the underprivileged people. And I've always thought that way. And I've always dedicated time. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I give people a hard time when they say, oh, we did a marathon on YouTube and we raised, yeah, whatever. You know, why don't you go and, like we were talking about with Street and Candy and them, go to Temple, Texas. Get your ass, your big ass, get it on a plane, fly into Texas and give 100% of it and then work with VF, VFW because the Forest Fem was a veteran. And have it at Marvin Fence Park, right? And it's all for the kids. You teach them how to do fly fishing or whatever. You know, try to work with the schools. And, and man, the town will love this shit. And the VFW is already a non-for-profit. They already have all the tax stuff worked out. <clears throat> the only thing you have to do is go get donations or prizes or things that you can raffle off in order to earn money to go to the children, right? But the but the VFW the better they already do that the towns know how to do it they run carnivals they run uh, funding things all the time you don't need to do that you know I certainly wouldn't want K Pro to do it I don't need her to do it I I, I want you know I, I I know how to do it myself the street knows how to do it and there's plenty of people that know how to do it this is not rock thing hell Candy knows how to do it because she sat there and ran the um, the event that we did on Street's channel and that was fun and everybody had fun and all we were doing was trivia. We didn't need to make a big project out of it, you know, and she and she was kind enough to donate a prize. That's the only thing I'm talking about. You want to donate prizes, donate it to the VFW where you're doing the event and let the D VFW raffle them off. I'll hold it up and say, you know, this item here, this uh, 
This rainbow colored thong was donated by J Street. <laughs> you had to see. Um, you know what I mean? I mean, 3D bras donated this cool looking chest, you know, or whatever. How much do you bid? And people are, it's, it's not big items, you know, they're worth like five bucks, ten bucks, whatever. And you're raising the money. And the point is, the people know that their money, where they buy the raffle tickets, is going to go to the needy. So they might raffle like, you know, a thousand dollars worth of tickets on an item that's only worth ten bucks. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't need to be gold. Or an item signed by a silo. It doesn't have to be any of that. We don't need the Fenn family to do any of this. I think the town will do it. Exactly. So, so it's all charity. And not only that, it's in Temple, Texas. And Texas is central in the United States. So you're not, you know, because everybody on the East Coast gets left out because who the fuck wants to travel all the way to hell to West Yellowstone or, or, or Santa Fe? Um, yeah, it's beautiful for the people that live in California or up, up near Wyoming or up in Montana. But what about the other two thirds of the con- country that live east of the Mississippi? What about those people? You know, out of the 350,000, two thirds of that was from the East Coast. Just figuring out statistically like that. So have something in the central. So it's fair to everybody. Everybody could drive, fly, whatever you want to do. You, you don't need to work a deals out with hotels. The, the people are smart. <laughs> they know if I'm, they're going to fly in, they're going to need to get a hotel, let them book whatever hotel. You're not going to, you know, anybody that tells you I'm going to get you a deal at the hotel, okay, I'll tell you right now, you know how that happens. What they do is you, you contact the hotel ahead of time, and the hotel will give you kickbacks for promoting the hotel, and they'll tell you, I'll give you on the discount rooms if you do this, and and you end up making money at it indirectly. It's just like when they do a telethon, right? You, you're running, um, ads while you're doing a video you're running ads you're getting ad revenue you're getting uh, advertising and all of that stuff so people do that for that reason they're making money but you don't need to do all that stuff all you do is you pick an existing organization like that's neutral like the veterans would be perfect let them do it they know how to do it they know where to get the soda from the hot dogs the hamburgers they know the vendors they they're all going to be locals a lot of the people that show up are going to be local people because it's for the kids. It's not really a fan specific event. Um, it's not um, for adults. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing like a, a, a pool tournament or a, you know, or a poker tournament. Those are cool. Those are for adults. People like that stuff. But that's really tailored for the searchers. It's not for the kids. So what better way than have a bunch of games from the 1940s? That kids would play outside, like marbles and stuff like that, and let them let them do that. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of money to bring a bunch of marbles and frisbees and you know lawn darts, and sticks with hooks on them, you know, for fishing or whatever. I mean, it's not a big project, and then the food and all that. Just don't worry about it. Let the BFW take care of it. They'll do it. They'll pay for it. Fire department will be there to handle the fires. You know. What birthday? Oh, your grandkids' birthday street. Happy birthday to your grandchildren. But yeah, I'm probably going to go too. It's two o'clock. So you know who will be coming home pretty soon. <laughs> so I got to get my, my big ass off, off this uh, here. So yeah, like I said, I, this wasn't about forest. And I hope maybe somebody learned something or maybe somebody got interested in some of the technology I talked about. And you'll go look at it. Have fun with it. I mean, that's what it's all about. If you're going to be miserable, you know, or, and it's not always about discussing solutions, you know, everybody can find a neutral common ground. You don't need to be talking about yourself all the time. And we can have fun. If not, then what's the point of even being here, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's 403 here. Yep. The kids' cures. Yeah. Hero kids' cures. Yeah, really. No, I mean, it's the same thing you're talking about. I think we're giving away those items and stuff like that. They don't even have to be valuable, like Dave Pisano, where he put out that uh, the cheap the the cash, the geocache. This is this is a fun thing. I mean, we could we could hide stuff out in the middle of a field, like they do on Easter egg hunts, and have the kids go out and find treasures. It doesn't need to be valuable gold. Hell, you, you can hide. Fake gold, but there's chocolate inside of it. I mean, you know, and you get one of the local stores to donate that shit like that. Just small trinkets, and the, the kids love that stuff, and they're 
even little, you know, real tiny kids, their parents could be running around looking for it because we, we hide it in obvious places and stuff like that. It'd be fun, you know, and it would be really cool, I think. And, and, and I think between street and, and uh, other searchers, you know, and uh, candy, that's all you need. Just work with the VFW or something. Uh, or, you know, but you don't, you don't need to involve others. Or just let them do their own thing. They got the World Series of Poker for the adults. They got, you know, the uh, Fenbury and, and whatever else. Like, Lully runs all these events. Matter of fact, the pool event would probably be something that would tie in good with uh, Lully, uh, Lully's event because it's up there near that bar. Maybe you could work out a deal with one of the local pool companies, you know, but that, but it's more suited for adults. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking about doing stuff for kids. So. And, and, and I think Forrest would like that. Just like he, he went through the expense and the work of flying the kids down to San Lazaro, I think it would be cool if we did the same thing. And the only reason why Temple just works out so perfect because it's in the middle of the country and it's where Forrest Fenn grew up as a child. You know. So anyway, everybody, um, I hope you have a great week. Um, I got to go to uh, the doctor again tomorrow. I went for a different appointment last week. It's that time of the year, and then three months from now, I'll be back doing it again. So sucks. I got to get up early, but I'm going to get out. I got some things I got to do around here before, uh, before the wife gets home and kicks my ass. So everybody have a great day and have a great week. Um, and, and thanks for uh, stopping by, and I'll talk to you all later. Peace. No problem. I, I like doing this. I ain't got nothing better to do right now. And I, I like talking to people and I like trying to teach people things. And it doesn't always have to be about a solution, you know. So I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.